thank you for uh, your invitation, uh, Stefan and all. Uh, it, is, uh, it was a, a bit risky to invite me because I'm not uh, an economist, I'm not um, a computer scientist, I'm not, uh, I didn't develop any crypto or payment system. Uh, so what I am doing here, that's the question. <laughs> um, I would like to introduce uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, money manifesto, um, which uh, it's a draft. It's not already uh, published. It will be published on, on the um, with the help of the peer-to-peer -peer foundation and on many uh, websites uh, and, and several uh, review. And I will make a, also a short video of, of this uh, manifesto uh, in uh, next months, and maybe to. Uh, understand the spirit of it, I can show you um, a previous video I have done for another subject, but it is quite linked. It's about the symmetry of the protocols. And of course, there is a strong connection between the protocols of the network and, and, uh, and money. I'll let you see this, I hope it sounds okay. As you may know, one quarter of the Amazon rainforest has been cleared already in order to print reports about net neutrality. <laughs> Did we forget something? Maybe? Yes. Non-tech people usually imagine that the notion of symmetry in terms of networks is a synonym of equality of up and down streams at users level or in out streams at the level of the peering points. But the notion of symmetry goes much further. It is also and mostly a question of protocols. When Vincent Cerf, one of the godfathers of the internet, recently appointed by President Obama to the National Science Board, asserts that internet is symmetric. No doubt that he's taking it seriously. Yes, internet is, potentially, symmetric, because it contains in itself all the resources to become effectively symmetric, and the big players have the responsibility to implement it. If they do not, they should not complain about the domination of Google and other data silos that do precisely benefit the asymmetry of the net, as it is in reality. In fact, the Internet as people know it so far, essentially implements asymmetrical protocols, such as the well-known HTTP of the World Wide Web. These asymmetrical protocols, called unicast, make it necessary, when you want to achieve an all interaction, to establish somewhere a special node, which is responsible for the switch. According to the power law, it is obviously the biggest node that wins, because it allows to connect as many people as possible. In this game based on an asymmetrical protocol, the winner takes all, every time, Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. which are, I would say, not social networks, but social silos, to the point that, after a while everybody is a prisoner of these silos, and nobody is interested to play anymore. However, there are also symmetrical protocols on the internet, one may think about peer-to-peer -peer protocols such as the ones used on mesh networks, but more fundamentally, the general model of it is called multicast, defined as a part of IPv6, which allows all troll relationships without the intervention of any particular center, if it is the Internet in its entirety. Unfortunately, these protocols, when they are not fought by institutions, such as peer-to-peer, are not or little made available to the public by the ISP and telcos, which keep them for themselves so far. We understand why. The multicast protocol greatly saves bandwidth by allowing a transmitter who wants to send a video to a million receivers simultaneously to emit it only once. Then the routers distributed on the network replicate it, according to the requests. This is usually how we, simple users, receive the bullshit of the TV channels. But as you may have noticed, you can't emit anything that way, because, for all of us, 
the net is artificially asymmetric. So, obviously, when some can use the net symmetrically and others cannot, there is no net neutrality at all. Remember what Van Jacobsen, another internet guru, asserted in 1995? How to kill the internet? Easy. Just invent the web. Unfortunately, this is more and more relevant. By not making symmetrical protocols available, many network players are condemned to play a game where they lose every time, and users too. Indeed, as a recent skirmish between free, a French ISP, and Google, denotes it. The profitability of network carriers is much lower than the one of big nodes, YouTube, etc., and other huge data warehouses. That essentially asymmetrical protocols make them absolutely necessary. Note, also that all of us, simple users, we lose also, because our personal data are drawn into bottomless pits over which we have no control. In short, in order to escape this depressive spiral which centralizes all the innovation and economic power in the hands of a few players, it would require a day where, users as well as operators and others, become aware that another internet is possible. A symmetrical internet. Within the meaning of, data flow, and, protocols. Therefore, the internet could be a little more neutral than it is now, because it would any more favor dominant positions automatically. The future would cease to be written in advance. The innovation that seems to be dry today outside from dominant silos would revive. Finally, the peer-to-peer -peer spirit developed by the pioneers of the internet could reach adulthood and show its full utility. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, you, please. What do you think of the projects of some governments to tax the platforms, like Google, on the basis of the personal data they hold on citizens? I fear that it will lead to clear and other quarter of the Amazon rainforest before they realize that it is not a good idea. The intention behind is good, and I would not want to overwhelm the authors of this idea. But I have many reservations. The main one is an ethical issue. I think in a world where there is more and more a sort of fusion between ourselves and our data, trading such data will look more and more like human trafficking. The taxation of these data cannot do anything against that. On the contrary, it would endorse the existence of this practice. Another question. Yes. If I am right, the establishment of a symmetrical network would necessarily involve the legalization of the peer-to-peer -peer sharing of copyrighted files? A symmetrical network would facilitate the sharing of all types of files, and the benefits would be huge for the culture and the economy. This does not mean that sharing copyrighted files would be legal. The copyrighted files represent only a drop in the ocean. Is the defense of this drop a reason to stay in the stone age of networks? According to you, how will we finance all this? Thank you for asking this crucial question. Many researchers emphasize the parallelism between the asymmetric shape of the web and the current mechanism of money creation which is also asymmetrical. How can we achieve a symmetrical network in those conditions? If you want a symmetrical network, it is necessary to design it in such a way that it generates itself a new form of currency which has to be also symmetrical. Some people work on it. This may be the subject of one of my upcoming keynotes. What could be the triggering event of such a change? The network has operated until now because there was a certain symmetry between the big fish of the net. However, this symmetry is being broken. There are essentially three options for them. One, being eaten by the biggest one. Two, find an agreement between them, including with states, to make a sort of triangular trade of our personal data, that is to say, our identities. 3. Recreate the symmetry, not only among themselves, but with us. The first two solutions are ultimately quite explosive, and I weigh my words. Only the third is sustainable, but nobody knows how. This is why we must be aware about that. If I understand you correctly, the solutions 1 and 2 prevail currently. Do you think there is some kind of conspiracy? No, there is no conspiracy at all. Just, dare I say, 
one of the greatest mysteries of mankind. Indeed, as far as we look in our body, or in the universe, there's no center, no governing body of all others. The brain which is often attributed this virtue, if it has functional areas, is not built as a hierarchy ordered by any center. It is essentially a symmetrical network. The mystery is to know why we, essentially symmetrical human beings, are building essentially a symmetrical and hierarchical social networks. Nothing says that we must be structured as hordes of primates or wolf packs, right? So it can change. But in fact, Google offers us to become transhuman, even immortal. You ask good questions. I've sported you. The question is, who would become immortal? Is it the man? Or is it the idea that the man shapes about himself? I mean the idea that some men who derive their power from the asymmetry of the networks, form about all others. I'll return to this point in the next keynote. Please, may I ask another question? Thank you. But now I have a slight prostate problem. I must leave you. Ask your questions on the social silo Twitter with the hashtag WTF Talks. I'll answer later with pleasure. See you soon. Well, go back to the P2P money manifesto. It's about the same spirit. And uh, it's so the, 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 the short video I will do uh, will be a, a quite the uh, same idea. Uh, so I, I'm not uh, an economist, not a computer scientist. Uh, I'm uh, an artist, some kind of artist, but I think, in my opinion, everybody is somehow an artist, so I am uh, an average uh, citizen, let's say that. And uh, what do I have to say uh, about uh, crypto uh, currency as an average citizen? That's what I want to explain here. Uh, I think first, I would say that the situation, not only with cryptocurrencies, looks like a, a big mess. These days, alternative currency models are popping up everywhere. Uh, we know that uh, these models will combine, mutate, uh, or disappear until a new ecosystem emerges. But what ecosystem and what will be the cost of this mutation? In order to accelerate the transition to a legitimate and sustainable model, I will propose some selection criteria for these currencies inspired by the theory of evolution, by an anthropological hypothesis on the origin of language, and by network theory. Um, in order to envision what's the sense of this big mess uh, we experience right now in the human history, let's request the help of this wise man with a long bart. It's not uh, Bernard Lieter, it's not God, it's Darwin himself. Um, our mankind is the result of two era of uh, evolution which can, be, which can be seen as two successive explosions of God. The first era is called Ha Biogenesis, from a world without biology to a world with biology. This is an explosion of biological codes. The second era is called by some researcher Ha Technogenesis, from a world without technology to a world with technology. And this is an explosion of symbolic codes. This second era we, uh, with, um, started with a big mess caused by the invention by some hominids of the first tools that they use as weapons, not only to kill animals, but to kill each other. So weapons made social order based on physical domination brutally obsolete. Some researcher, Jean-Louis Dessal in particular, assume 
that this event caused an enormous political crisis among hominids. And this crisis has originated the human language as an evolutionary uh, stable strategy. Um, and thus, uh, language overthrew brute force to become the driving element of our social structure. And I come to the point. Some hundred of millenaries after this first big mess, we are experiencing a new big mess, a second one. Our weapons have evolved to get together with our language to the point that they have almost merged. Money and capital is probably the most sophisticated and ultimate weapon that institutes our social order for a few centuries or millenaries. The one who owns the weapons, that is money, capital, can easily kill the one who don't own it. This is the root of the big mess we are experiencing right now, which has the same order of magnitude of the first one. Thus, we have to find a new evolutionary stable strategy, just like hominids did a long time ago. I assume that this strategy will drive us to a new era, which may be called the ha eso genesis, to a, from a world without ethics to a world with ethics. And this era would, be, would originate a new explosion of code that would be ethical codes. So, speaking of ethics and legitimacy isn't easy in the context of um, the evolution theory. In most social interaction models, such as uh, the one of Niklas Luhmann, the individuals are considered as agent with deterministic behaviors within the social system, just like puppets. Thus, this, these individuals have very little power to change the system, even less if the social system is robotized. In order to lighten the social pressure on individuals, one may dream to act on the social system by, by modifying the code of its robot. In this category, I may quote the three laws of robotics by Isaac Asimov, the ethical artificial intelligence by uh, Bill Ebert, some kind of mass about uh, embed uh, ethic, um, uh, a continuation of uh, Isaac Asimov laws robotic, and the free software initiative, the copyleft, GNU public license, etc., by Starman. These initiatives are good, but not sufficient to ensure the ethics of the system. If tomorrow a, dict uh, a dictatorial regime wanted to create a new concentration camp, no doubt he would use free software because it is cheaper, more efficient, and cynical. The ethical way I would like to introduce today is more button up than the previous one. I argue that it is possible to define some criteria that everybody can understand and apply in order to assess the legitimacy of the network we belong to. The word legitimacy is usually defined in the context of philosophy and political science. I would rather define it in terms of art, geometry, and connective science. The root in the geometrical and artistic of the geometrical and artistic meaning of the notion of legitimacy is the optical perspective discovered by Filippo Brunelleschi at the beginning of the Renaissance. Very quickly after this breakthrough, everybody was, uh, who was looking on a picture painted on a canva was aware enough to assess or not the legitimacy of the construction of the optical perspective. 
and for two centuries, we have invented new ways of representing the world, that is, networks. Networks do not produce optical representations of space, but reflect its flows in an anoptic manner, that is to say, in a non-optical way. Networks act according an optical perspective defined by their central nodes and their core protocols. Thus, it is possible to build legitimate construction of this new perspective, of course not in terms of geometry, but more generally in terms of topology and cognition, in order that everyone inside in the network would be correctly taken it into account. And finally, this is a proposal of um, the criteria. There is three criteria, um, named A, A, B, A, B, C. So the, the criteria A is, like you can read, does any agent A have the, a real right to access the network and vice versa? Can he leave it freely? It, it is the first criterion uh, which maybe makes sense. The criteria A, B is is any agent B, present or future, including the agent we design, develop, administer the network, treat it like A. And criteria, uh, criterion A, B, C, if agent A, B, and C, where A, B, C is the beginning of the multitude, belong to a network that meets the first two criteria, is it enough in order that they recognize one another as peers? So that's cognitive uh, criteria that could, uh, I think, that, that are quite simple and can, can be understood by uh, everybody and uh, apply to uh, a wide range of networks and, of course, to new uh, cryptocurrencies, old currencies and new currencies, or payment systems, or everything. Uh, everybody can uh, ask for himself those questions and try to uh, understand the, the network uh, in which <coughs> he, he belongs to. Uh, for instance, uh, a few uh, examples. Uh, let's uh, make an evaluation of Facebook according to this uh, criteria. Uh, of course, Facebook does not, doesn't meet uh, cr the criterion A, B because uh, its creator, Mark Zuckerberg, is not treated like, just like uh, any agent A or B. Of course. So, Facebook is not legitimate. <coughs> The euro or dollar doesn't even meet the criterion A, as it is almost impossible to uh, to not trade in euro, in euro within the economic zone defined by this currency. In with this criteria, it's not legitimate. And Bitcoin, uh, uh, I should have uh, written a little b. To, to speak about the currency and not the protocol, that's two different things. Uh, I think th the, the currency, Bitcoin, the currency doesn't meet uh, the criterion A, B because the early adopted, uh, adopters are not treated just like any agent R or A or B who come after of course, the early af uh, adopter of Bitcoin uh, owns own uh, a lot of Bitcoin. <laughs> I try to to to, uh, uh, to get some Bitcoins uh, a few days ago. Uh, I, I get a micro uh, micro micro Bitcoin for <laughs> too much money. I think uh, I love to, uh, there is. 
so many people who have uh, tons of bitcoins. Uh, it's it's crazy. It's not. It's, it's, there is a, a, a deep problem with this question of early adopters. We are today so rich, you know. So we could uh, we could uh, um, analyze like this many 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 other uh, cryptocurrencies or payment system etc. Um, to try to, to, to find if they are legitimate or not. Uh, thank you, and if you have any questions...